So good morning, everyone. My name is Kirsty Hewitson. I'm Exec Director for Capability at Innovate UK KTN, and I'll be chairing this opening session. I'd like to welcome everyone to this first international conference focused on industrial applications for metamaterials. I'm going to start by acknowledging the UK's excellent reputation in metamaterials research. It is no mean feat being ranked third globally after the USA and China. I'm sure that everyone would agree that the time is right to connect industry and investors to these leading academic research efforts so that these exciting developments can be scaled up and brought to market for social, environmental and economic benefits. That is why Innovate UK, KTN, set up the Metamaterials Innovation Network with the aim to facilitate successful exploitation by identifying commercial opportunities for metamaterials, building a collaborative metamaterials innovation community and connecting them to opportunities. On the landscape map, you'll see that the network has engaged widely across the value chain for metamaterials, connecting researchers with industrial players, investors, and end users. Also providing evidence to support government in developing both infrastructure and policy to ensure the UK benefits from the opportunities metamaterials offer. We must all play our part in creating the kind of environment that is required not just to foster research and innovation, but to incentivize business to capture value and invest to create wealth for the UK. This conference is an important milestone for Innovate UK KTN Metamaterials Innovation Network. You'll now see the agenda for the plenary, plenary session. It is a great pleasure to welcome our keynote speakers for this session. Very shortly, we will hear from Professor Sir John Pendry, Imperial College, who will give us a keynote address on the history of metamaterials and what the future holds. This will be followed by Professor David Smith of Duke University, USA, who will share his experiences of, experiences of commercializing metamaterial technologies. We'll then hear from Dr. Irene Kramova, MetaBoards, about the challenges SMEs face in taking metamaterials to market. And finally, we will hear from Casey T. Green, Invention Science Fund, about the challenge of funding innovative new technologies, such as metamaterials. Before we move on to the talks, I would just like to remind you that there will be no question and answers, but feel free to put questions in the Q&A box, and some of these will be addressed in the Q&A panel session starting at 4.30. I'm now going to invite each keynote speaker in turn to speak, with a reminder to please keep your presentations to 10 minutes maximum. We'll start with Professor Sir John Pendry to give the opening address. Sir John is Professor of Theoretical Solid States Physics at Imperial College London. He is world renowned for his research into refractive indices, and coming up with the idea of bending light in such a way that it could form a container around an object, which effectively makes the object invisible. So John began his career in the Cavendish Laboratory, Cambridge, followed by six years at the Daresby Laboratory. In 1992, Sir John developed some of the first computer codes capable of handling novel photonic materials. This interest led to his research, which concerns the remarkable electromagnetic properties of materials, where the normal response to electromagnetic fields is reversed leading to negative values for the, for the refractive index. In collaborations with scientists at Marconi, Sir John designed a, ser designed a series of metamaterials whose properties are more to, their, more, more to their microstructure than to the constituent materials. These made accessible, completely novel materials with properties not found in nature. Sir John's work helped to stimulate the great research interests that we are experiencing in the UK in metamaterials. And with that, Sir John, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Kirsty. I'll share my uh, screen now. Um, can you see my screen? Not yet. Hopefully it'll appear in a second. Can you see that? Not yet. Not yet. OK. Um, right. Oh, I see it's not 
share. No, now we can, it just needs to go into- Now you can, screen. very good. And that should be full screen now. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, it's very exciting to see the UK treating metamaterials so seriously now, a time we didn't. Um, it's my brief to tell you a bit of the background uh, history, uh, what's some of the novel things that are going on at the moment, and um, finally to, to have a peep into what the future might hold. In the beginning was a collaboration with the Marconi Company, um, initiated by Will Stewart and funded by Ian Young. So Ian, I believe, will be speaking uh, later in, in this meeting. And they were interested in radar absorbing material. And it was with a view to generating a material with a magnetic response, but without magnets, that we developed this split ring structure, which gives the properties of the material through the um, structure it has rather than through the chemical composition. So this, uh, these split rings are about a centimeter in diameter. They um, are made of copper, which is non virtually non-magnetic, and uh, they, they, they give uh, a magnetic response. And one of the strange magnetic responses that can be engineered from this structure is uh, a negative uh, permeability which uh, is, is rarely, if ever, found, found in nature. And it was on that that uh, David, David Smith, who will be speaking next to me, if uh, he's logged on by that time, um, which interested David Smith and Shelley Schultz, who were at UCSD at that time. And this was uh, 1999 at uh, Laguna Beach, where I presented this work. And they made this structure here, which was key to the interest uh, which, has, which uh, has accrued to, to metamaterials. This structure incorporates the split rings which give ma negative mag magnetism and some uh, electrical resonators, uh, which I discussed in an earlier paper, uh, which give negative electrical response. And that created something which had been uh, the, the holy grail for, for a long time. Uh, it created a material with a negative refractive index uh, and that had a sensational response, I think, at the APS meeting in uh, San Francisco. Um, and that really sparked the interest of the community to such an extent that people even now assume that the only thing metamaterials do is to make a material with negative refractive index. In fact, that's uh, far from the truth. Um, some of the most interesting applications and in commercially important are made with metamaterials materials which uh, have a positive refractive index. Um, so what's been happening with metamaterials? I mean, early days were theoretical developments and uh, uh, um, experimentalists showing how things could be made uh, easily. Or, or, or not, how the frequency range could be extended. But uh, more recently, applications have emerged. And one of the uh, important uh, developments has been to make metamaterials reconfigurable. And they have been used to make phase arrays, uh, one of which you see here. Um, uh, they have low power requirements and so on. But I won't talk about this too much because both David Smith and Casey de Green have been intimately involved in this development and they're far more knowledgeable than I, I am about this. Um, the, these are used in SATCOMs and uh, in security applications. So I'm going to talk about other things. Um, and um, here is one of the topics of current interest to, to the community. Um, uh, and it's called epsilon near zero materials, which is uh, a, a material where the permittivity vanishes and interesting properties follow. Now, uh, it can happen in indium tin oxide at near infrared frequencies or, or at lower frequencies. It can easily be engineered using metamaterial technology. Now, Many of you will know this formula for the wave vector, which involves the square root of epsilon. And if epsilon is zero, then the wave vector is zero. And that means that waves propagate without any phase change, 
through, for example, this section of vent waveguide, which is filled with an epsilon near zero uh, material. As it happens, another property of these materials is that they allow transmission without reflection. So you can do more or less anything you want to the waveguide here, and your signal will come through uh, undistorted to, to the other end, providing the cross sections of the two end uh, match. Um, another interesting property of epsilon near zero materials is that um, they enable uh, non, uh, very much enhanced non-linearity. At optical frequencies, especially, this is important because uh, normally non-linearity is extremely weak and uh, the, there's very little you can do with it unless you have a very intense laser. But this um, property of epsilon near zero uh, gives uh, uh, an insight as to how we can uh, engineer our way around this to some extent. So here's the formula for the refractive index, which as I've explained is proportional to the square root of epsilon. And if you expand that uh, and include this ter chi three term for the non-linearity, then you see that the refractive index, which determines the properties of the material, the refractive index scales as inverse of square root of epsilon. So if you make epsilon small, you vastly increase the response, uh, the nonlinear response. That can be further ex um, expanded by <clears throat> uh, placing on the surface a metamaterial comprising um, a, a series of uh, gold uh, antennae, which locally enhance. And so in this way, um, uh, you, can, you can enhance the, the, the nonlinearity by a factor such that you can use ordinary laser powers to, to get substantial nonlinearity. Another theme, which is, um, I can get this to move. Another theme which uh, has emerged in the last uh, decade is uh, creation of lenses using metamaterials. Now, an ordinary lens um, is lenticular in shape because it uses the thickness of the lens to change the phase of the wave that it passes through. And by changing the phase, it can arrange focusing at, uh, at the, the engineered focal length. Uh, the alternative to this is to use a metamaterial structure to change the phase of the wave going through that particular part of the lens. And here's a concept developed by the Capasso group at Harvard, in which they have uh, resonant elements, which you see here in this, the, the picture, uh, whose shape and orientation vary uh, from place to place. Uh, and in doing so, you can make a, a, a lens using this two-dimensional object, which which uh, typically is much, much thinner than the, than the wavelength. So you can make astonishingly thin lenses. Its drawback in the first instance was that uh, it only works at one frequency, but uh, there, are, there are ways of engineering uh, around that. And by the way, uh, not only can this, uh, this phase plate, if you like, uh, focus light, you can also <coughs> engineer phase plates, which can develop wave fronts, which involve in uh, very, very uh, dramatic uh, ways. Uh, I should mention that electromagnetism, uh, it, although it's the home of metamaterials, is, uh, is not uh, a monopoly of, of metamaterials. And acoustics is increasingly uh, joining the field. And a lot of the engineering in acoustics is much, much easier than it is in uh, electromagnetism, uh, especially in the visible region. Here's an application of a noise cancelling screen, and you can see it's, it's structured. Um, and that structure is, is there to exclude noise. Uh, these uh, uh, noise cancelling panels are, are being deployed in hospitals to um, uh, cut out noise from patients who, who, who are really very seriously ill and will be disturbed by it. Um, here are some parameters. Um, and this, yes, here, here's a close up view showing the metamaterial structure of uh, the resonator. Uh, Nissan is also in, involved with, with this uh, because they, they, with their silent electric cars, they, they now discover that uh, they still have road noise, so they want to cut that out as well. 
Um, the concepts on watch it space were developed, I think, first of all, by a guy called Ping Sheng in Hong Kong at HQUST, where I'm a visiting uh, professor. Um, and it solves a problem of excluding low frequency sounds, which are, are, are dogged by uh, the uh, traditional architectural solution, which is the lower frequency, the sound, the thicker and heavier the wall you have to put in its way before you can reflect it. But Ping Sheng lighted on a very clever way of uh, uh, reflecting sound without having something massive. And that is to use metamaterial resonators. And here's a, a, a sample of its structure. You can see these resonators here, which correspond to the little cells you saw in the previous um, commercial application. And they consist of uh, a rubber membrane with a weight in the middle, which tunes the frequency of the resonance. And in this particular experiment, they put this structure in, in an a, a, a acoustic waveguide, a tube, and uh, it, it bounces uh, um, sound off it very, very effectively. Um, another crowd of people who are getting in on the story are people who are interested in mechanical properties of materials. Um, and there's been quite a lot of interest here. Uh, you can develop novel properties such as a negative Poisson's ratio by having a structure that uh, has this um, so-called reentrant structures here. Here's the unit cell, and you see this this sort of yeah reentrant structure. And when you squeeze it in one direction, instead of going out in the other direction, it actually contracts and come in. And these guys have uh, used this reentrant structure to um, by incorporating some heat sensitive elements here to make a, a, a material with um, a negative thermal expansion coefficients. So I think I'm getting towards the end of my time. So I'll come to what might happen in the future. Um, a lot of interest, largely theoretically, in so-called topical topological structures. And these are, are, are designed so that uh, you, you have a, a complex metamaterial structure with a, a topology that can actually result in waves which travel only in one direction. And therefore, if you have an obstacle, and here we see a waveguide with a kink in it again, and normally that kink would be quite a good reflector of radiation, it isn't uh, because uh, in this particular instance, we, a, a topological material has been included, uh, which has no backward traveling state into which to scatter the radiation. And so uh, things get through without being attenuated. Um, what else? Um, metamaterials that vary in time, and I don't just mean reconfigurable, I mean taking advantage of the enhanced Chi 3 so that you can actually modulate materials on a time scale which is comparable with the frequency of the radiation itself. And some of the work I'm involved with is looking at these uh, strange materials which are called luminal structures, structures which travel appear to travel at the velocity of light or greater than the velocity of light. And they have novel amplifying properties, which uh, uh, generates uh, supercontinua and uh, have uh, novel coherence properties. So with that, I shall come to my conclusions after my 10 minutes and more up. Um, Metamaterials, they're a mature field. We, we've stood the test of time that they're around for about 20 years or more and they're spreading into a wide range of disciplines academically. But now also there are many products deploying the technology as we feel today, um, including, uh, by the way, I should add the new 5G systems, and they'll certainly be a part of 6G when it comes along. Substantial investment in the USA, and especially in China, China is investing enormously in this area, especially in the military area, um, further healthy growth, product range can be expected. Thank you very much. I'll stop staring my, my screen now. Thank you, John. Thanks very much. Now, at this point in the agenda, we we're supposed to have uh, Professor David Smith, who's yet to join us. So instead, we'll move on to our, our third speaker, 
and hope that David joins us in the meantime. Uh, and that's Dr. Irina Kromova. So Irina is the Chief Technology Officer for Metaboards, a UK company based in Oxford. She has experience in technology commercialization and academic research and a solid background in both engineering and physics. Irina is responsible for the development of wireless charging technologies at Metaboards. And over to you. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for the introduction. I hope you can hear me. I will start sharing my screen in a second. And that should be on. Could you please confirm you can see my screen? It's just coming up now. Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Irina Kromova. I'm the CTO of Metaboards. Uh, we are the company who, uh, uh, one of the pioneers of the metamaterials technology, specifically in the RF electronics world. Uh, today, however, my talk is not specifically about Metaboards so much in what we do, but about um, the challenges that typical uh, and the typical SME journey uh, or journey towards becoming an SME uh, a startup may face. Um, sorry, I hope this works. Yeah. So Metaboards are based in Oxford. We are a spun out from Oxford University and we are developing a metamaterial based technology that will allow to enhance the user freedom uh, for wireless charging solutions, specifically for low power electronic devices, uh, such as smartwatches, uh, a smart pens, smart this, smart that. So essentially take any of the little helpers that we have around us and what we want is to charge them wirelessly and with a lot of flexibility and freedom for the user. Uh, so as I've said, uh, this talk is not specifically about metaboards per se or our technology, but I would like to present to you who we are and, our, uh, on our, and where we are in our journey. We, uh, we began as a company in 2016 because this is where um, all the magic happened and we uh, became a company. Um, we're a spin-off from Oxford University. We have very strong academics uh, on our side. Uh, Chris Stevens, Ekaterina Shamonina and Laszlo Solimar were the founders of the company. Um, and where we are now in 2022 is uh, we're still in Oxford. We are now a team of 14 people with experience management, uh, with plenty of uh, uh, success uh, stories behind our backs and an excellent technical team with a, a very broad uh, expertise and skills. We have a strong IP portfolio, uh, in-house design tools, fully equipped labs and work and demonstrator. So essentially, long story short, we are, as people say, poised for success. So this is all looking great on paper, but obviously, as any other startup, we face challenges along this journey. And uh, specifically, and most importantly, these challenges are related to funding. And today, I would like to share some of my thoughts, and they are not specifically related to Metaboards per se, but also are inspired by um, what I've learned from other uh, companies that I've met um, um, everywhere really in the world, not only the UK, but specifically in the UK as well. Um, so back to Metaboards, uh, just to give you some background of which area we are covering. We are uh, developing a solution which will uh, help us wirelessly charge low power electronic devices. And the need for that came from the fact that uh, the number of devices grow. Uh, day after day after day, and obviously we will hopefully see some Internet of Things um, deployment in the future, in the near future. So we will see more and more electronic devices helping us every day. So plugging them and charging them is difficult, and we would like to make wireless charging uh, more user-friendly compared to where we are now. So uh, our metamaterial-based technology helps us charge multiple devices at the same time anywhere on a large surface. And uh, specifically now, uh, our technology is compatible with the latest near field communications wireless charging standard, which is great because this standard has just emerged and it promises to service many billions of devices already on the market. And uh, it's so widespread, so we believe it will be a great success and uh, a standard of choice for low power electronics. 
So long story short, again, uh, our solution is for obviously consumers who will love to have freedom from wires, um, manufacturers as well, who would uh, benefit from lowering the manufacturing costs because now they will not have to supply a charger with every device. Uh, for educational spaces, because this will allow us to <clears throat> provide power solutions for smart classrooms. Uh, healthcare, where essentially there are so many uh, monitors and devices that need to be charged every day, and hopefully our, our technology will make it a little bit easier. Um, with regards to how we uh, got to where we are, and we are at the moment not, I wouldn't say we're a successful business as of yet, because we are not quite there yet. We are a great, uh, we, 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 are, we are a great startup. Uh, we've got to a certain point where we have a working demonstrator and a great team, but we, we are not a successful business per se. Uh, so, which is why I think it's important to mention that um, this journey was a possible thanks to the support network that we've had and uh, of course, it's the investors, specifically our major investors in Oxford. And uh, this is usually the main source of funding for any startup, um, mostly. Uh, we were quite successful with uh, <clears throat> securing some funds from the UK uh, innovation funds, specifically Innovate UK. Uh, we uh, successfully applied and completed a a smart grant with the continuity grant to follow on from that from that grant. Uh, the issue with those grants, unfortunately, is that they are only available for sufficiently well-funded companies. So it is not something that a company in trouble can apply for. Uh, obviously, there are strict eligibility uh, conditions, and I will I will uh, talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we believe it's it's important to mention our. Uh, network in the research area. Uh, we have uh, very good uh, links to uh, very strong universities in the metamaterial area, such as the Exeter University, Imperial College, and the University of Oxford. And this is a great source of uh, not exactly funding, but uh, new hires, uh, R&D, and uh, outsourcing some R&D processes. So, uh, if we think about the startup as a journey, uh, usually where it begins is at the point where you have the vision, a good idea, uh, there is some cutting edge science uh, going on and you think, wow, this is gonna revolutionize this and that. Usually this is, um, it sounds quite exciting. It uh, creates interest and it is not exactly enough, but it is a good push towards generating interest in investors and uh, with a lot of work and effort on many levels, uh, it is possible to, to get some seed funding. And typically uh, for uh, a hardware, <clears throat> hardware a startup company, uh, you would see a, a forecast of a timeline that looks like this. So uh, you will have some time spent on the prototype demo, uh, demonstrated development, and then you will see some uh, revenue generating projects in the future. At some point, you will go into profitability. And finally, you promise success, which interestingly is a very uh, different thing in the academic's eyes and uh, uh, the investor's eyes and also some of the industrial uh, people's eyes. So for the academic community, uh, generally success means uh, some form of a leadership on the market. So it will become a big company uh, producing uh, excellent products or uh, excellent services to the world. For investors, however, and for a more um, commercially oriented people, uh, success also entails a potential exit. And there are, it is not necessarily um, being acquired by a big company and disappearing from the earth. It's, it, it could be a number of different things. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And I'm just saying this because I know there are a lot of academic uh, uh, people in the audience. So there are a number of ways we can define success. However, a few months into this journey and what we see are technical challenges. I don't think I've ever met anyone who has been on the startup journey and who hasn't had technical challenges along the way. Um, these challenges uh, are natural, they are normal, uh, but specifically uh, for uh, high-tech and metamaterial-based technologies uh, in particular, 
these challenges come from uh, a number of uh, very important reasons that we should take into account when we start a company. The first one is a huge gap between the science and the market ready technologies. And huge is an understatement uh, because uh, there is clearly a big, big, massive gap between what we say we can do as an academic research um, institution and what we can actually do when it comes to uh, providing this, uh, supplying this product to a customer. So it is not a question of optimizing, it is a question of starting the R&D process sometimes from scratch. And as I've said uh, a couple of times, uh, I'm not sure if there is a, a single PhD program in the world that can train uh, a future PhD, uh, a future um, researcher in such a way as the startup can do, because you have to do uh, an excellent level research in a very compressed uh, time slot under a lot of pressure and you have virtually no room for mistake. So uh, training, uh, training uh, the, the, uh, from the point of view of training, it's really a great opportunity. Um, also, it's important to understand that sometimes uh, we may be misled by the uh, <clears throat> amusing gimmicks that sit in our technology. So we could be attached to them uh, emotionally because it looks cool uh, on our research portfolio. And sometimes it uh, deviates us from the real, uh, the real perspective of does it actually make a difference for a real product to become a viable, commercially viable solution. Sometimes the learning curve is too steep. Obviously there is, we need to account for that when we start a company. And uh, of course the usual suspects are uh, the fact that the budget was a bit too low for what we actually need as we, as we uh, proceed on the journey. COVID-19 has impacted uh, a lot of companies, including us. Uh, this is something to be aware of uh, in the future. Hopefully we don't have another pandemic, uh, but still it's a good, uh, it was a well, terrible, but a good uh, learning, less, a, a good lesson. So uh, risks and mitigations plans should be taken seriously. So that said, uh, once we overrun uh, our usual, our, our predicted timeline, it is possible to get additional funding uh, and Innovate UK is a great uh, uh, place to go to uh, and, uh, and uh, probably engage in the project. However, we need to be very careful because it has to be uh, specifically focused on developing a commercially viable solution. What may happen next, unfortunately, and it did happen for many companies, for some of them I, know very, I knew very well, um, after you've done all you thought you could do, you kind of crash into the market. And uh, it is not exactly a punch by the market, as some people say, the market punches you in the face. It is us running headfirst into this wall because we didn't think about uh, a number of things and uh, it could be avoided. Of course, markets are living organisms and they move on and it's not always possible to predict where where we will be in one year, two years time. However, uh, some things are specifically uh, typical for a high-tech startup or a material-based startup. We like our research output so much that we think, oh, this is a great solution. Let's look for a problem now. And this is usually a very dangerous path because uh, it is unlikely you will find a, a, a problem that looks for a solution. You have to think from the point of view of where we can make a difference and then develop towards that. Again, I have kept the same item on the same on this slide because this gimmicky uh, aspect of uh, metamaterial solutions specifically is very um, dangerous because we need to be very uh, clear about what we want to achieve and metamaterial has to be the purpose. Uh, sorry, uh, the uh, means, not the purpose. And of course, most importantly, uh, sometimes we've just went for the wrong market. And uh, <clears throat> this is, again, a, a question of preparing ourselves well when we start a company. So funding our way out of this situation is extremely challenging. It's not impossible, but uh, it will have to be a very bespoke solution. There aren't any specific funds for rescuing companies in trouble. Etc. So uh, it is. It is. Uh, it's good not to be in that position. Uh, I'll give a Metaboard's example just to illustrate uh, a, 
a journey of a startup. We haven't had, of course, we had technical challenges. We haven't specifically hit the wall, but uh, we've had a pivot along our way. Um, so in 2019, uh, we had a very successful uh, demonstrator, which we presented on uh, mobile at Mobile uh, World Con Congress uh, in uh, in Barcelona. And we already had some customer engagement. We had the first customer uh, proof of concept project. And this demonstrator was charging um, uh, three mobile phones uh, on a large A4 size surface at 6.78 megahertz, which is, was at the time the so-called AFA standard. It was all going really well, but then 2020 brought a lot of changes. Uh, first, of course, is everyone knows about that, that's COVID. Uh, many things went sideways and uh, many things got delayed. So we had to rethink uh, how the company will work, of course. Uh, and uh, most importantly for us is the market moved on. We were quite uh, quick to notice that. So the market moved from one wireless charging standard to another, which is called Qi. And it took over pretty much all the mobile phone uh, manufacturers uh, decided to install the Qi uh, chargers, the, the Qi receiver coils in their, uh, in their uh, devices. So uh, MetaBoards did think about a Qi as a potential solution and uh, Innovate UK did support us on that um, journey. We also very quickly and ruthlessly realized that that was not a commercially viable solution at least at the time, because we clearly compared uh, to, to the market conditions and where we would be if we went after that. Uh, however, we also noticed that there was an emerging standard coming up, which is called the NFC wireless charging standard. NFC, for some of you who may not be familiar with that, is uh, uh, how we pay uh, when we use a contactless payment system or how we open a door with a key fob. This is all near field communication, so it's quite widespread. Um, so what MetaVoz decided to do at that particular uh, point uh, was a hard decision, but we decided to pivot and go into stealth mode and uh, focus on uh, developing a new technology uh, in the new space, which is below power electronics based on this NFC wireless charging standard. It was a difficult decision, but we uh, essentially thought it was the right way to do, uh, the, the right way to go. So today in 2020, we have a new uh, solution, uh, a new demonstrator, a new set of IP to cover that, and we're ready to go back and fight for the market. So hopefully we are well poised for success, as people say. Um, I, If I have a couple of minutes, and uh, please uh, notify me if I overrun, um, but if I have a couple of minutes, I wanted to quickly bring up a few things that are metamaterial specific. So metamaterial as, a, as an area has a very particular issue of, um, it is very tempting to say it's a metamaterial technology when it's not. And I encourage uh, all of the research groups and research centers and even the companies to uh, think a few times more before we say it's a metamaterial. Um, and also to ask a question about whether it's key to our innovation. So to illustrate that, I use the uh, analogy with this, the, the famous tale of uh, stone soup, where the soup is actually made of many other things, but the stone is there uh, as, a, as a decoration, as a, as a conversation starter, if you want. So specifically for metaboards, uh, I have to be completely honest. Uh, if you ask me if this is a metamaterial solution, uh, I say yes or no, it's debatable, uh, it's a question of semantics. For us, it is a metamaterial because we approach the system from that perspective and it allowed us to uh, treat a, a very complex multi-element system without fear. Uh, however, we still are on the mesoscopic level, so we're not talking about the macro level where you have uh, refractive indexes or some other macroscopic parameters. So it is debatable. Uh, we like to stick to the metamaterial concept, but we are quite open when people uh, try to fight that and say, well, that's not a metamaterial. It's, uh, it's also a possibility, it's semantics. However, it is key to our innovation. So definitely without that, we wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't have this technology. 
And uh, the other important question to ask for a metamaterial based uh, technology is, can you do the same without a metamaterial? And this is something that uh, well, personally I've noticed a lot when I was in the, in the research, in the academia, that it's very tempting to add a metamaterial and do something uh, without thinking about, oh, could I have avoided adding a metamaterial to my system? And uh, I, uh, I was joking, but now it's, uh, it's probably a reasonable proposition to use some form of a due diligence for, uh, for metamaterial technologies, because uh, the first question that we should ask is, do we really need a metamaterial on there? Can we do the same uh, or better? Can we do a better uh, performance without a metamaterial? Uh, again, for metaboards, the question is probably not. If we agree, we use a metamaterial because there are uh, alternatives uh, to our solution and they have pros and cons. Uh, obviously, some, some, are more, some are simpler solutions, but they have uh, tuning issues and efficiency issues, restrictions. Uh, some other solutions are probably uh, also as complex as ours, but they require high power switches and they're limited in size, whereas our approach gives a little bit more uh, freedom in expanding the charging service, surface and also we don't require high power switches because we propagate the power and the communication signal through this meta surface. Uh, so uh, to us specifically, yes, we have to use a meta material or whatever you want to call it. But again, I would like to uh, bring everyone's attention to the fact that sometimes we misuse the word uh, meta material technology because it is only a metamaterial technology if you cannot do it without metamaterials. Um, so uh, that brings me to my conclusion. Uh, it's not even a conclusion, it's just a few key points uh, of this talk. Uh, I would like to say that commercial viability is a key word for every startup. We should focus on that from day one and both words matter. It has to be viable, it has to work, it has to be commercially viable because it has to be a selling, pro a selling, uh, a, a selling proposition. Um, pivoting may be inevitable, but uh, funding a potential pivot is extremely challenging and we have to prepare for that from, again, day one. And specifically for the funding bodies, it is also, I guess it's a balance because uh, if, uh, if there were funds available for every company in trouble, the companies would have become research centers. So it's, it's, it's also very tricky. Uh, but again, it's important to remember that that may be uh, a case. And uh, metamaterials technologies uh, need to be reviewed from a very uh, reasonable standpoint, as in, uh, do we need a metamaterial? Is it a metamaterial? And is it the key to the innovation in that particular technology? And only after that, we can say, yes, definitely, this is a metamaterial technology. Um, so uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, uh, our company is, uh, prese is presenting an, uh, a demonstrator in the exhibition booth uh, online. So everyone is welcome to, uh, to request and schedule an appointment with us. And we are happy to show you our technology. There is also uh, a talk which I will give uh, to give you a bit more detail of our technology in the consumer electronics section uh, later in the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irina. That's that's very much appreciated. Um, next up, we have uh, Casey to Green. Casey was the president of a fund called the Invention Science Fund, one of the sub funds at Intellectual Ventures. Casey's fund invested heavily in metamaterials, and during his tenure, he also served as the executive vice president of the Invention Science Fund, leading the fund in launching spin-out companies to commercialize homegrown technologies in communications, imaging, medical, software, and radar as well as establishing the world leading metamaterials commercialization center. A prolific inventor, Casey is named on more than a thousand patents. Has a unique perspective on the process from basic scientific research to commercialization. And we're delighted to have him sp speak today. So Casey, over to you, thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I first have to say, I didn't uh, keep David from speaking just so that I could have more time to talk. But um, anyway, uh, I guess uh, one of the things that I, I, I will probably end up doing today is echoing quite a bit about what everyone else has said. Um, but, but I think the main points I wanna to make today really relate to the, the history of how we got here to give kind of a perspective 
of setting ex to kind of set expectations about how long this might take and some of the steps that one might take in the beginning to do to have a better chance at success. So <clears throat> first, I'll give you the, the boring history a little bit, which is um, we actually began working with metamaterials back around 2004. Um, in fact, I think I first saw one of John's patents back in 2002. Uh, so this has been about a 20 year effort. Um, originally, uh, we looked at the technology because we were built, we were looking just at IP. We were essentially a, a, a lab with a, a mission to uh, find hard problems, solve them and figure out a way to make money off of them. Um, no one else really had that kind of investors who would be patient enough with us. So the second thing would, that happened was our first spin out was actually a nuclear power company. So one, unlike most people who are investing, I could go back to my investors and say, you know, that, that th these new investments in metamaterials, they're a lot shorter term than our last investment, um, which is kind of crazy because to a, a VC, the timeframes we're talking about here are, are glacial. They're, they're, they're um, in, the, in the form of many, many years. So in the early days, the first thing we had to do was understand really what is metamaterials. There was sort of this emerging definition. And even today, uh, I think as Irina said, is there's not a great definition of metamaterials that everyone can really understand. There are, are characteristics of metamaterials less than half a wavelength, uh, a bunch of a variety of different ways of characterizing them. But the, there's not really a, you can't really go to a VC and say, you know, this is metamaterials. And they say, oh, I understand what that is. They, they'll, they'll, even if they have someone who says they know metamaterials, they really don't. Um, the second thing that happened way back in the early 2000s that was sort of key was there was a lot of skepticism back then. I don't know how many of you were around when there was a lot of statement about, no, you can't really have negative refraction. Oh, this, this you know, negative index or complementary materials are not possible. But um, we still thought this is the most, this is one of those technologies that has an almost unlimited amount of potential. And it's one that can kind of change the fundamental rules about what people think they can accomplish with technology and with, and eventually that will emerge into what they can accomplish with products. So um, that actually is the fundamental thing that has driven metamaterials over the years is it's one of the few technologies that can truly change the game, the rules of the game around commercialization. That's great, but it leads to the second phase of the difficulty in the early stages, which is not just explaining to someone what a metamaterial was, was but what's it good for? And if you gave a, 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 a grocery list of all the different things you could use metamaterials for in RF, in optics, in acoustics, uh, whether it was for RF coupling or power beaming or satellite communication or radar or imaging there's a, a, or pure optics or LIDAR, um, most VCs don't take that very well. They, they think you're not focused. So uh, instead of having the problem of, can I identify a, a fundamental advantage of my technology and make a statement about why it is really the thing that someone should invest in, you have you end up having to hide, I won't say hide, but emphasize certain points of what you really expect the te technology to be able to accomplish and then present that to someone as that this is what we're going to focus on, even though there's other potential applications. And um, so I've sort of started with this sort of tale of whoa, it's it's hard. Um, hard tech takes a really long time to 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 commercialize. No one understood what it was. No one um, could you could, no one would understand that there's a, an infinite world of possibilities, uh, or they weren't they weren't actually built to invest in an infinite world of possibilities. They wanted to focus on tell me what your product is and how much it will cost and how much you make on each project product. But the good news is. That started 20 years ago, and much of that ground has already been broken. Um, since that time, we've launched seven companies, ranging from satellite communications to uh, a radar to LIDAR. And there's, we used to talk about the emerging market for metamaterials. And, and if someone looked up the metamaterials market back in 2008, 2009, there was no such state, there was no such thing. Um, and then by about 2000 and, 12, I think it was 2013, metamaterials started showing up with references in things like 
um, TV shows and, and movies and it got a lot of press. Um, of course, there was the, 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 the sort of big splash that was made when John and David did transformation optics and, and, and discussed the invisibility, the possibility of an invisibility cloak. Um, and then, then the number of references to Harry Potter or uh, Star Wars that I got in my email was probably 50 to 70 a day. But that kind of splash kind of built a bit of a buzz. Um, so now the, the good news is there's a market, there's a buzz. There are proven companies. So right now, it is not, you're not considered crazy if you put money into meta materials. Um, that is sort of, I would call it a story of success. Um, it's the kind of success that one of my investors told me would make his grandchildren rich um, as opposed to him because the time frame is so long. Um, nowadays, that time frame has been shortened so dramatically because of, of, of several developments. And that's kind of the area I was going to focus on in this talk a little bit is what are the things that have happened since then? Well, there are companies that have been, um, some of our companies have been listed as most uh, uh, exciting new startup or most disruptive technologies or uh, fire starters or they've won prizes at conferences. So the visibility of, of this of the, of the technology as a real product rather than a pure technology, a real enabler of products rather than a pure technology has, has that has happened already. So that's the good news for anyone who's trying to uh, take their technology from lab to commercialization. Um, the second part of that that's interesting is when you build a startup company around something, there are a series of things that have to go into building the company that people often neglect they think I've got a great technology, it's a better mousetrap, people will come and, and that's all I need to do. But in fact, that is sort of the genesis of the idea and a small percentage of the work. The, the construction of a, a vision, a team, a, a marketplace, a product definition, all of those are pieces of doing a startup. And nowadays you can actually hire someone out of grad school with training in metamaterials. If you tried to hire someone out of grad school with training in metamaterials to be one of your technologists, if you tried to do that in 2005, there were maybe seven or eight postdocs that were working on it that, at that time, I think, that, that, that were available to be hired that weren't professors. Um, and, uh, but now there's a pipeline of, of, of really bright people that have come out. And pretty much every company that we've started has had someone who had at, at least one or two people who are out of these, these programs as the technology sort of center on the metamaterial side. So man, building a team is actually doable today. So now we've got the time frame is long, but it's credible as a, as a technology. It's proven that people can make uh, companies out of the technology and build products around it. There's actually a way to build a team around the product and around the comp for the company. Um, and the next part is okay. Now I've got too too much possibility. What is the product going to be, and how do I how do I get that funded? And that's that's an area that is beginning to emerge. So, um, classical classic version of starting a company is you have a great technology, you have a product vision. Uh, you go to a VC and or someone else that you're looking to invest, and in, you say, "This is a great technology. Here's a product that will work out for this. Uh, here's here's how it all works." And it'll be better than everyone else and we'll make a lot of money. And here's, here's how we'll make a lot of money. And they immediately go back and they'll look at your financial model and they'll beat you up over your financial model, how much you're going to make on every product. And then they'll send the technology out to someone they deem to be an expert to look at it and say, does this stuff really, really work? Well, it turns out that for many, for, for over a decade, there really wasn't anyone who was in the business of being a, a technical, uh, an industry expert. Uh, who could actually speak about the technology and what its competitive advantages were, or what it was, what was real about it? Once again, that that work has been done, so that's a that's a good thing, and and now that 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 kind of thing is available. So all of the pieces are now available to start companies around metamaterials, and that probably only has begun to emerge in maybe the last five or six years. Even though we began our first company twelve years ago, we were sort of uniquely we had a unique set of investors who were interested in sort of longer term investments. So um, what are, the, what are the, re the remaining big barriers? Well, for about maybe 12 years or so, 
the last 12 years, um, most investment capital has gone to someone who can write, who thinks they can write a dog walking application in 24 hours with, you know, seven programmers and a bunch of Red Bull and Red Vine uh, and throw them in a room for a weekend and, and out pops an application that will become the next, you know, billion dollar uh, startup. Um, the concept of actually investing in hardware and finding a supply chain and and proving the technology and getting you know, the, the right kind of approvals for the for whatever it is you're doing, whether it's radar or or laser or whatever, all of those sorts of things were, had historically been out of favor in the VC market. The good news is that hard tech is kind of coming back in vogue. Um, there are specifically funds now that are formed to invest in hard tech. So that's great. So now you have the pieces of all the pieces are there. You can bid it, you can build a team, you can you have a shot at getting funding. Like everyone has a shot at getting funding, but as Irene will tell you and other people will tell you, that shot is, you know, is is the high the probability that you walk into a meeting and that you walk out with an investment on any given day is very, very low. But if you do enough meetings and you get good enough at presenting, you'll probably find um uh, an investment if your if your pitch is solid and your business is it makes sense. Um, describe that as the kissing frogs, and you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find that that prince um, is is sort of the the the, the, mo the model for uh, raising capital in some cases. In other cases, there are actually specifically targeted funds, and that's something that's just begun to emerge. There are now hard tech funds, and even my old company spun out a, 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 a venture capitalist who is specifically for meta materials. It's called Meta VC. Um, so that that's great. So let's talk about the the. the I'll give you some tr sort of examples of how the world, how how, how we um, built these companies and, and made them successful. Uh, and I'll, I'll do that real quickly, just to tell Thanks, you that. And I'll, we'll do a lot more about commercialization in a minute, but um, I'll just say. That's the kind of thing I'll, I'll give you those examples on the plenary session at the end of the day. Um, there are so many good companies out there now and um, they've been successful and you can raise funding, but there's gonna be a lot of work involved. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. And apologies for cutting across you there. I was just conscious of time. But that, thanks for Luckily, I got some time back from David. Uh, yes. Uh, so apologies that David Smith couldn't join us today, but I'd like to say a massive thank you to all our speakers who have contributed this morning. It's been greatly appreciated. Uh, and that just leaves me to say that I, um, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. I urge you to go to the remaining sessions. There's three parallel sessions that you can see on the screen there. And um, thank you very much and enjoy your day. Bye bye.